Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. If you love the games, we are the show for you. Each week we share stories from athletes and people behind the scenes to help you have more fun watching the games. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? I'm fine, but nobody wants to hear from us today. We should just get to the interview. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because today... Dick Brown's here. I don't know how this happened. I don't know what voodoo magic we did behind the scenes. Clearly, he had not listened because he did not know what he was in for. (laughs) But what a gentleman. What a fantastic interview this was. We had way too much fun. Yes, yes. So kind, so polite, so very generous with this time. So so generous that we have a two-part interview. Dick Pound, thank you so much for joining us. You've had an incredibly long career connected with the Olympic movement. Let's start a little bit about your memories of being an athlete at the Games. You were at Rome 1960 as a swimmer. Thanks for remembering all that way back. (laughs) As a swimmer, when did you realize that the Olympics were a possibility for you as an athlete? It kind of creeps up on you, especially in in swimming where you, you tend to start very young. Uh, and, and, the, and actually, it was even more striking for the, the females because you, you would be talking about a 14-year-old veteran of international competition. I was 18 when I, at, at the Olympics. In those days, there wasn't much money in any of the sports systems. So basically, when you finished university, you were finished uh, high-level competition because you had to get out and get a job. But anyway, my uh, it was my first time ever in Europe, and we had a uh, Air Canada, it was called, still called Trans Canada Airlines at the time, hired a jet from, left from Montreal and flew overnight to Rome. And, and uh, that was pretty exciting. And you come down through the clouds and you say, oh my God, there is a Vatican, you know, there, there, there is a forum. It's not, not like all of the books we'd seen. So that was, it was very exciting. No particular expectations. I'd been in the Pan American Games in Chicago the year before and was horrible. And so I didn't have any any great expectations, but all of a sudden in the heats I, I, of the 100 free, which is my event, I get to the semifinals and say, well, that's pretty swell. And then in the semifinal, I, I got in, in into the final and uh, never, never expected to get that far. And uh, it wasn't a perfect swim by any means. And, and if you get something wrong in a sprint, you're kind of toast. Everything's really got to work in order for you to succeed. But Anyway, so I, I came sixth, and, and we had a, a relay team, a four by 100 medley relay, in which we came fourth. So the close but no cigar. But it was a very exciting time, and, and Italy was hopelessly organized, but, but fun ne- nevertheless. And so we, for, the, for the first time, you actually see some other sports. You, know, you tend to be in, in kind of a little silo or bubble in your own sport, and so you know, you, you know who the swimmers are. But I didn't know the track and field folks or basketball or boxers or anything like that. And luckily, the swimming was in the first week. So basically, in the second week, I was able to go and see all kinds of events. The, the, the track and field competitions were fantastic. Cassius Clay won the, the light heavyweight boxing. And, and so that was a, a, a real eye-opener. Uh, the other thing was, it, this was in it, really at the nadir of the of the Cold War, and, and everything was pretty two-dimensional. The view we got in North America about the Soviets was uh, about as mechanical and, and contrived as you could imagine. And I'm sure it was the same way from them. But all of a sudden, these, these are, are people, and they were nervous, the same as we were. And I, I know a couple of them before the events would go into the bathroom and throw up, they were so nervous. So uh, they became people. You couldn't talk to them, both as a matter of language and, and also they were not mixers at all. But, uh, that was kind of a, an eye-opener for me and, and 
they sort of became people rather than objects or or caricatures. What was a village like at Rome? Because I went to Rome a few years ago and wandered around some of the Olympic venues there, and, and the village was one of the places I saw, and it's kind of a cool little complex. What was it like for you? Well, it was basically brand new, and I remember one of the uh, unusual features about it is it was basically as if it was on stilts, and so there was parking and so on at ground level, where, where in those days it's not to keep the snow away, it's to keep your, your car from turning into an oven because of the, uh, the heat. So it was good. We had uh, we had sort of basic apartments. In one bed, I shared a bedroom with one of the, the other swimmers. And, and basically, uh, it's kind of fun. And, and, the, and you're eating in the, in the uh, big cafeteria. And I can remember we walked in and, and sort of one of the tables on the way up to where you filled up your trays was the French team. And there they were all having glasses of wine. And that was, OMG, what on earth? How can you be drinking in, in the Olympic Village? And so there were things like that. I, I remember uh, there was a, a little gymnasium where you could play, fool around and play basketball. And I, I had long arms, not much of a jumper, but I could touch the rim, uh, which is, I guess, 10 feet or so. Anyway, one of the Soviet high jumpers, a fellow called Valerie Brumel, came in and he, he looked at us, tipping the uh, thing with our hands. He backed up five, six yards, took a couple of steps, jumped, and kicked the rim, and and then was was able. You know, there's a floor. There are no no cushions the way that the jumpers have now. And then he was able to control his movement so that he landed on his feet coming back. And I said, "My goodness, uh, you know, white men really can jump." <laughs> of course, thank goodness he didn't get hurt doing that. That would have been rather problematic. If he didn't get hurt, no, 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 he, he didn't. No, he was a, a very fine athlete. Uh, and we saw Wilma Rudolph, who was the, the the heroine in the uh, coming back from. I think she was one of thirteen or so children, and she'd had polio as a youngster and came back and won the hundred meters. So uh, there were a lot of really good feel good stories that that, you know, that came out of that, and it was generally a huge amount of fun. So you retire as an athlete, you go back to school. You come out. What brought you back into the Olympic movement? Uh, two things, I guess. Uh, one is, I, I think, if you've drunk from a well that was dug by volunteers and others who are helping, you kind of have a moral obligation to put back into that well at least as much as you took out. And, and so I started officiating at swimming meets, and I was, I was going to be a, a, a chartered accountant, a CPA now, and I became the treasurer of the Quebec section of the Canadian Amateur Swimming Association. And I was uh, carried on doing that for quite a while. And then one day at the, at the sports club where I ate lunch for almost every day of the years I was in college, it was also the place where the Canadian Olympic Committee mafia had lunch. And, and I remember one day somebody came over and he said, young pound. I, I was I was young pound. And I said, yes, sir, which is what you said in those days. He said, you're a chartered accountant, are you? I said, yes, I am. He said, you're going to be a lawyer. I said, well, if I... Passed my bar exams next uh, April, whatever it was. Yes. And I, some signal must have passed between him and the others at, at the table. He said, how would you like to be the secretary of the Canadian Olympic Committee? Oh, I've been in college for about eight years now, so I really know what to say. Gee, that would be swell. <laughs> what do I have to do? And he held up his hand. He said, uh, you leave that to us, young man. And so in April 1968, I became the secretary of the Canadian Olympic Committee. And a year after that, the president in 1968 was given a one-year term for being a faithful secretary for many years. And then the following president lived in Vancouver, 3,000 miles away. And, and so I was basically running, the, the, at this point, age 27, running the, the National Olympic Committee. A year or so after that, in 1970, Montreal wins the, the 1976 competition. So there I was, the secretary of, of the, the host National Olympic Committee uh, for the 1976 uh, game. So I was certainly in the right place at the right time on, on many occasions in the, the whole Olympic experience. I want to ask a quick question about Munich 72, since you were there. And that was one of those big decisions of the games will go on. And what did you think at the time? And what do you think now about that decision? 
Well, Montreal, the games were, were always going to go on. What had happened was that they fell behind, and the city of Montreal fell behind in, in some of the construction projects. But but it was post-Munich, where all of a sudden Olympic security was not just crowd control and, and keeping the, the boys out of the girls' section of the Olympic Village. It was a capital S security. So the level of security in Montreal was much higher than ever before, but but not, not obtrusive. And even though we got our, our financial situation in trouble, it was partly because there was a, a, a Quebec-based minority government and, and the rest of Canada thought that with Expo 67, Montreal had, had more than its share of, of federal and other support. And so there was not much enthusiasm in government circles for a Montreal choice. And then, lo and behold, we won. And, and, and the, the mayor of Montreal at the time, Jean Drapeau, staged a, a brilliant campaign because we were against up against two superstars at Los Angeles for this 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And then the Soviet Union uh, announced that it would like to be a, a candidate. And so Drapeau steered his way, I thought, brilliantly through those particular shoals and basically said to the IOC members, Listen, you don't have to get one of the superpowers mad at you and, and, and the other not sure whether or not you voted for them. Montreal is a good, safe choice. It's got all of the the advantages of the Eastern time zone in, in the States and, and all of these economic issues that, that were a factor. But, but, you know, you didn't have to make the U.S. mad at you. You didn't have to make the Soviet Union mad at you. No, nobody could really complain about the Montreal. So it was a very, a very adroit campaign that he ran. And he was a very personable war. I, I can remember when he came bidding against Toronto and Hamilton and Montreal were the three city sites. And, and he came in with a, a kind of a motley group of sort of the, the local sports stars. And he said, gentlemen, because we were all only men on the board of directors of the, the National Olympic Committee in those days, you have two decisions to make. He said, the first is, do you want the games to come to Canada? He said, if you don't care, then it doesn't matter who you vote for. But if the answer to that first question is yes, your second question is, who can get them? And he said, I can get them. And here's why. You know, he, had, he had finished second to Munich in the, for the 72 games, and, and he used uh, Expo 67 very carefully. He invited every IOC member with his uh, spouse or some other friend to come as his guest at, at Expo 67. And he said uh, an astonishing number of the IOC members showed up and, and saw firsthand what Montreal could do and what a fabulous city it was. Anyway, that got, got everybody thinking about it. And I remember I was the secretary, so I, I was the scrutineer for the, <laughs> the votes. And the first round of voting, we had 36 people in the room. Toronto got 17 votes. Montreal got 17 votes. And Hamilton got two. And we thought, oh boy, we're cooked. Um, but lo and behold, the two Hamilton votes came to Montreal. And so we snuck through with a majority of, of two out of the 36. And uh, it was a pretty exhilarating uh, decision for us. And then when we actually won, even more so. What did that teach you about evaluating bids? Because then as an IOC member, you saw a lot of bids over a lot of years. Well, as, a, as an IOC, I mean, I was in the Montreal thing, I was very partisan, of course, and so forth. But it, it, when you're an IOC member, so the question number one is, can these people do it? It's too big a puzzle to put together at the last minute. There's a reason why you get six or seven years to, to organize the games. So can they do it? And there wasn't much doubt about Montreal's ability to do something like that. Well, no, nor... Uh, to be fair, uh, either Moscow or Los Angeles, uh, you wouldn't have any doubt that they they would mess up the organization. Uh, the flavor and the atmosphere might be different, and, and they all are different uh, in every games. But you would not be worried about can they do it? And so that was was number one for me. I mean, I remember when we were voting on the games for 2016 that were eventually won by Rio. Their slogan was "It's time for Rio," and, and I kept saying. No, it's not. There's a reason they've never had the games of this nature in their history. They know football or soccer, but 
not too much about the many of the other sports and they're not well organized uh, which proved to be the case i mean we, we we were on the brink of catastrophic failure every single day during the real games and usually you know, transportation takes a while to kick in and you, you got a lot of drivers that don't know their way around the city very well and they haven't been, been trained for that but this never got any better what was happening inside the IOC during that 2016 games because the press was certainly aware, but the sports were doing very well. But what was that? Was there panicking? Was there finger pointing? What was happening? Well, at, th- at that point, you're you're most concerned with making sure that the games are completed on time. And, and you know, you'd go to on television, look pretty seamless, I'm pretty sure. But you, you'd think, oh, oh, it's field hockey. Hmm. I thought it was going to be volleyball. Well, it was supposed to be volleyball, but you know the stadium lights were not working or something like that, and so they just plugged in a different sport. And the innocent television audience didn't know, but on the ground, it was just a mess from beginning to end. So it was a um, almost existential as we were going through that. Uh, you know, are we going to get out of here alive? And and as they say, barely made it. The, the police were were disorganized. The traffic control was not good. A lot of the stadia were not really ready for games of this nature. But we got out alive, and it'll be a while before we're back in that part of the world. I will say this with a bias, because I lived in Chicago at the time. Who would you have preferred as a 2016 host? I thought Chicago was by far the best candidate and and would have done a, a fabulous job. The problem was they didn't have a story. You know, why, why do you want the games? And it's not enough to say, well, because we'll, we'll do them well. So London had a story. Uh, uh, Rio had a story. <laughs> That's all it had. But, you know, it's time for Rio. It's, they've never been in Latin America before. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's time. It's like the chant of, of going to Africa one of these days. And, and one of these days we will. But we'll pick the time. And, and we'll do now with the, the new method of selecting host cities, we get a much better appreciation of how the games will look and wh- where they will be and and are the facilities in a, each facility in a place where they'll be after use. And we had, we had a problem with that in Tokyo because there used to be a kind of a, you know, the, the games should be a, in a fairly concentrated area. Well, Tokyo is the largest city in the world already. And they were stuffing in a village and a, and a, a ruinously expensive stadium in, in a place where there was almost no room to move. And, and so we'll, that's one of the reasons that we changed our own mantra, that, that you don't have to be that uh, compact an overall site as, as used to be the flavor of the month. What host city surprised you the other way? The idea being it was much better than you were worried about. Which host city surprised you by doing such a good job? I would say probably the, the classic model would be Lillehammer in the, when we first changed the cycle of, of games. And then, you know, it's a winter sport country. It has almost as many medals as, as Germany in, in the winter games. And they did a, a terrific job and in, in so on. Sydney did a very good job. The Los Angeles in 84 did a very good job. I remember that the media was filled with speculation, earnest speculation about how many Olympic athletes were going to die during the Olympic Games because of the smog. And the, the freeway system, you know, it's going to be a parking lot with sort of 5% less traffic because it was in the middle of the summer. They were fine. And all of these things that are conjured up in the media. It was was like the the Zika virus in Rio. It's the wrong place and it's the wrong time. It was never going to be an issue, but that was, that was the story. Unlike what we did with Tokyo and and Beijing, where the story was right. It was, you know, the pandemic was a real issue and and it was very well managed with with different styles, as you would expect between Japan and, and Beijing. But Beijing was sort of, jackboot type stuff it was just the, the zone may not have been much fun but it was probably the safest place in the world during that period of time to, to avoid covid and so uh, those are things that, that we've learned and they were much better at, at preparing them much better at, at preparing our own constituency uh, you know the, the national olympic committees and the international sports federations in how to deal with 
something like a pandemic? What are the measures you take? You know, and basically, notwithstanding, you know, the no vaxxers, you know, vaccination helps. If not for the immunity, it certainly minimizes the impact if you do get it. And so we're much better and much more adept at planning for what might go wrong. And in the Olympic Games, you don't get a second chance. You know, you can't say to you saying, well, oh, you're saying that was a fantastic 100 meters, but would you mind doing it again? Because our timing system didn't work, you know? So you've got a whole bunch of redundancies that have to be built in for that sort of thing. And then power, we have a, a separate power grid on standby so that in, in something like a tenth of a second, if there's a massive power failure, you're up and running again at the, at the games. So, so it's, a, it's it's in many respects, it, there's a certain amount of white knuckle concerns, but it's like a lot of things. If you think about what could go wrong, you're probably far more likely to have a solution than if you haven't thought about it. Speaking of what could go wrong, let's talk a little bit about Seoul, because Seoul is kind of an interesting games in that you had a dictatorship, you, you're coming off two games of boy or three games with boycotts. How, what were the kind of things that the IOC was thinking could go wrong and they wanted to prevent with those games? I'd say the organizational ability of, of the Koreans was, was fine. And, and they'd actually had a, a pretty good dress rehearsal two years earlier, having hosted the Asian Games. So they, they had a chance to, to try out everything. The, the, the concern was basically the DPRK. Was it going to do something stupid? Were the Warsaw Pact countries going to do another boycott? Because this is like a U.S. client state in, in their mind. And, and, and basically, it was interesting. After Los Angeles, the entire Warsaw Pact countries said to the Soviet Union, Look, we were not happy doing it, uh, missing Los Angeles. We are not going to miss Seoul. Do you understand that? No matter what you say, we will be going to the uh, the games. And eventually that got, we sort of knew when, when the Soviet Union opened up a consulate in Seoul, the first formal relations that it, it had had since the Korean War. And so that, that, that was a sign that they were going to participate and that they would be using their political influence with the Chinese, uh, with the, uh, the DPRK, to say, we don't want you to rain on our parade here. And then uh, as that was emerging, I, I mean, when, when the games were awarded back in 1981, DPRK was, was furious. They said, it's, just, it's, not, it's not possible, it's not proper, it's not thinkable to have Olympic games on the Korean Peninsula. In, in the present circumstance. We're still at war. We've got a truce, but, but the, the Korean War is not over. And that's, that was the, the, the mantra they had for a, a good couple of years, maybe even, maybe even more. Then all of a sudden, as, as can happen in these dictatorships, there's a, there's a 180, just to spin the dime, and all of a sudden, not only was it a good idea to be on the Korean Peninsula, but they, the games should be co-hosted. And the, the uh, DPRK said, no, we'll, we'll do track and field, gymnastics and swimming, and you can have archery and uh, team handball and stuff like that. <laughs> but, but it was at least a dialogue. And, and the amazing part of it all was that, that, I mean, these issues in Korea, in real life, are, are life and death issues. Leadership changes and all that can, can happen on a dime if you get that wrong. But Samaranch convinced the... Koreans said, let's do this as a dialogue with the two states on the Korean Peninsula. It's an Olympic issue. We're in charge of the Olympics. They have national Olympic committees. Let's have the dialogue, at least on the face of it, appear to be an Olympic family discussion. And, and the uh, Koreans cross their <laughs> fingers, uh, I guess, and, and let them do it. And Samaranch did, did an absolutely remarkable job. And, and the deal was co-hosting is a, is a wonderful idea. We just have to find out what's the best way to do it and what facilities are available and, and what schedules, how difficult will it be to get in and out of North Korea and so forth. And can uh, will the South let the North Korean athletes come in? And so there was never, we, we never said no. 
we kept the, the thing open and said, you know, we, even until up to the time of the games, even during the games, if they wanted to do something at the very end. So there was no no excuse on, on their part that, that we were not taking them seriously. The, the so-called non-aligned countries, you know they're aligned because they call them non-aligned. And they, they said, all right, well, the IOC is, is taking seriously the DPRK position. And there was enough time for, for them to, to realize that it was being taken seriously by the IOC and also that the IOC was not nuts. You know, there were never going to be any games in North Korea, but that was not the script. The, the meetings were, they, they bordered on, on kind of slapstick because the, the South Koreans would be, you know, as a normal sort of thing. The North Koreans came with a script written out word for word and they, their, their meeting delegates read the speech exactly as it had been written in Pyongyang. And then if there's a question, they'd all gather around and, and with, with the script and it would take many minutes before they figured out what their answer was. And their answer was to reread part of the script that they'd already read. So there, there was no possibility for these people to have any flexibility at all. But, but uh, Sam Ranch, he did a, a, a really good job. And, and if you were talking with Bill Mallon, he may have mentioned that I, I'd written a book. I said to Sam Ranch after, listen, this was such a remarkable experience that somebody should write it down before, you know, it's just a statistic that, that in Seoul, there were 147 national participating national olympic committees and they have no idea how close it, it came to, to not be the case so anyway it's it was called five rings over korea and it, it's a little dry but it's it, but it's certainly uh, the story as it unfolded with seoul when you were there was there any concern once it was actually underway no i, I capital c concern no i mean there's always the possibility that something could go wrong with a with a fire or a power failure or something like that, but no, I I think we were pretty satisfied that with with China there and the Soviet Union there and and, and all of the non-aligned countries, you know, the only one that was a, a significant minus was uh, Cuba. Cuba didn't go because North Korea, was, think of this, was supporting Cuba financially. Once the Soviets had pulled out. And so uh, even though they tried to get Castro to, to relent on that, I think keeping food on the table at home was a bigger issue for him. And so that was, but, and, and North Korea was never going to come. I, I mean, I think they would be very worried about letting their countrymen see the difference between the North and the South, even though the North is, I think, probably bigger population-wise and territory-wise than, than the South. But the, the difference between the two systems would have been so evident that it would have been difficult to explain away. What about North Korea now? Because it's still an issue. It, it's still an issue. And, and I mean, at the time, it was uh, Kim Il-sung, who was, who was kind of a veteran. I mean, he, he was very much on, on, on the uh, dictatorship side of things, but he, he, he wasn't somebody who would suddenly do something crazy unlike the current leader and and you well we saw we saw a little bit in in, in pyeongchang in 2018 where they where they marched together and so on that, you know they they didn't figure out as quickly as the south koreans did that the the cameras at the opening ceremonies get the right side of the team coming in rather than the the other side and so south korea got the uh, got the inside track if you like but that and, and having the uh, the mixed hockey team was never going to win anything, either a joint or a separate team was never going to be a, a player in, in the sense of competing for medals. But but at least that was good. And, and they had some fairly attractive state representatives at the game. So it, it can work. And, and uh, I think it was, the, it was the sister of Kim Jong-un that came, I, I forget who it was, but a, a, a very attractive woman and then some other senior officials. And their their cheering squad. How do you think North Korea will act once they come off suspension at the end of this month? I'm not sure they they will come off because they've announced that they're going to boycott anyway. But we'll see. They're not heavy enough as a sporting performing country as they are. Uh, you know, a, a, a small P player in, in the on the world scene. So we'll see. Uh, you know, I hope. 
for the, the benefit of their athletes that they do find a way to uh, rationalize coming. And, and it, it could, I mean, there's, there's an Olympic mythology that comes into play, which is that the, it's, the, it's not the DPRK that is invited to the Games. It's the National Olympic Committee of the DPRK. And, and that is, at least in, in Olympic theory, a separate issue that is not tainted by the particular state. Boycotts in general seem to come up a lot. So what is your feeling on the constant threat of boycott? Well, we'd, we always said it's, it's really a shame that the Olympics, uh, in the days when they were all in the same year, that the Olympics are in the year in which the U.S. president is elected. And in the old duality, you know, 50% of the world was going to be mad at the United States and 50% loved it. And, and so it was always a, a on the table. But I think the American public, in the end, would not. I mean, they were already furious about the, the the Moscow boycott. You know, we knew there was there would be a retaliatory boycott at the time of Los Angeles, which there was. Uh, although, you know, we, we certainly did some work on that to minimize it. We were saved in some respects by the fact that China showed up for the first time. And I think uh, Romania and Yugoslavia both participated. So they couldn't even hold the Warsaw Pact together. And that is one of the things that led to the IOC inserting itself into the, the process. I mean, we've finally said, you know, governments really don't care about the Olympics. For, for governments, it's a, a chip to be played for whatever advantage there might be in it. But it doesn't do anything to, to affect the event. You know, don't forget when we went to Moscow, we were against the entire lobbying might of the United States on a trumped up there. I mean, it was... This, the, the intervention in Afghanistan was, was not a move to get at the Middle Eastern oil at all. It was to prop up a, a puppet regime that shot itself in the foot. And so it was, it was a, a false premise that, that just didn't make any sense. But the, the U.S. Olympic Committee put up enough struggle that it, it forced Carter to say that this was a matter, not, not just a matter of national interest, national security for the United States. You see, Really? But then, the, in, 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 at least in those days, the, the feeling was if, if that's what the president knows and, and believes, he's the president, he knows more about it than we do, so you got to trust in your president. Uh, I think it would be a much harder sell today than it, would, than it was at the time. Do you think that some of the boycott talk that comes up today, especially around Beijing, there was a lot of talk, do you think that's partly due to journalists? Trumping the, much like the Zika or much like the smog, do you think that journalists try to bring up that topic more so than governments do? Yes, I mean there, there weren't very many governments talking about boycotting. There, there were lots of media and, and people there, and, and you can understand it. A lot of the, the you know the human interests and human rights people work very hard and very sincerely about problems that are, are more likely than not to be uh, real problems, and they get nowhere. China, it's just nothing. It's it's water off a duck's back, and and so they get frustrated, and they look around for some kind of a magic bullet. The Olympics cancel the Olympics, and, and then are, are quite offended when you don't do that. But uh, so yes, I, I I would say it was more more media giving giving an ear to the human rights groups who, who deserve a hearing, but they don't deserve to be taken as as the final arbiters of whether or not something like the Olympic Games go on or don't go on. Thank you so much, Dick. Next week, we've got Dick Pound on doping. I wasn't sure he was going to go there, but he absolutely goes there, which is fantastic. So we are looking forward to sharing that one with you as well. Speaking of Canada and Montreal 1976, our next book club is coming up soon. We are reading Inaugural Ballers, the true story of the first U.S. women's Olympic basketball team by Andrew Marinus. It was at Montreal 1976 that women were finally allowed to compete in basketball. We will have our book club show in mid-March, but we're also having a special free Zoom Q&A with Andrew on Monday, March 27th from 8 to 9 p.m. U.S. Central Time. If you're interested in coming to that, please email us at flamealipod at gmail.com and we will get information for how 
for how you can log into that event. And if you plan on purchasing a copy of the book, please consider going through our bookshop.org site. The commissions we make on purchases through our site will go to cover the cost of the event so we can keep it free for everyone. That link is bookshop.org slash shop slash flame alive pod. Also coming up is our movie club. We're going to keep you busy while you're stuck inside in the dark and the cold. That's right. We're watching Japaloop. Japaloop. The, the story of watch it. We're for, I, I really hope we're pronouncing that right. I know we'll find out, but hey, I've been doing my French Duolingo. I believe it should be pronounced Japaloop. <laughs> Well, this is the story of the French show jumping horse who won gold at Seoul 1988. If you watch it, let us know what you think. Hit us up on social at Flame Alive Pod and or in our Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook or email flamealivepod at gmail.com. We may include your comments on the show. That sound means it is time for our history moment, and all year long we are looking at Seoul 1988, as it is the 35th anniversary of those games. We are getting a lot of Seoul in the beginning of the year. I mean, it's exciting. I know, and it's fun because I don't remember that much of Seoul, which is is strange because I certainly watched it. I know, and it's amazing how much a game has an impression on you at the time, and how much of the stories fade away from memory because it's been so much fun talking with all of the veterans of the movement, let's say, and hearing their stories because, boy, I'm learning a lot and very excited that y'all chose this one for us, to be quite honest. But it's your turn. So what do you got for me? What do I got? So listener Meredith sent me a wonderful book called Soul 1988, A Guide to the 24th Olympiad. And as I flipped through it, I saw all of the services and technology that are happening for these games. And then it also had some things about the Olympic Village that piqued my interest. So I thought it would be a good time to look into what the Olympic Village was like for the athletes and officials who were there. So I uh, found a wealth of information in the official report. And as you may recall, as we learned from Yvon Dubois, who was the mayor of the Montreal 1976 village, it was very important to have the right amenities and activities to promote international friendship. And Yvonne actually consulted with Seoul 1988, along with the mayor of the 84, LA 84 village. And I think some, maybe some of the things he advised are reflected in what went on in the village. So the village itself, and we're talking about the main village, which they called Seoul City, which and not the four sub villages that were for athletes who had events stationed further out. Uh, so this was 86 apartment buildings. Okay, that, that's a lot of buildings. 3,692 units held 15,000 people. It's like, so it really was a little city. It's like co op city in New York. <laughs> so originally it was scheduled to open on September 3rd, but on September 1 at 10 a.m., France showed up and they said, let us in. Bonjour. And they weren't the only ones to ri arrive early. They had an 193 people from 17 different NOCs showed up that day. <laughs> so they had to check them all in two days early and uh, get going. I got to say that must have been so stressful to, to hey, uh, hello, the delegation from France is here. Can we let them in? What? We're not open yet. So those were the first people to arrive. The last delegations to check in were Burma and Libya. They checked in on September 20th. Yeah, way later. So Seoul City had two zones, the residential zone, which is where everybody lived, and a little fun tidbit from the official report where all of the apartment cleaning was done by female volunteers. Wow. We won't even discuss that. Let's move on. Okay. The international zone was where all the fun was. So big element of Seoul City, you can imagine, the dining hall. Planning the food menu is like planning the biggest wedding banquet. They started designing the menus in December 1986. They had a big tasting on September 17, 1987 at the Gymnastics Hall inside Olympic Park. 1,000 people were there for the tasting, including Juan Antonio Samaranch. Well, right, because you have to get international taste buds there. Right, right. And those international taste buds were kind of lukewarm on the menu. Oh, no. Yeah, I think that the Korean people liked it. The Western people did not like it so much, so they had to revamp the menu, and they reworked it to a five-day cycle that ended up being mostly Western-style dishes. 
which is, I think for the times, that makes a lot more sense. But, you know, it, it was, I felt kind of bad that they tried to have some Korean influence. They had a little bit of Korean influence, but it, it was really a Western style menu. Every day, they served a minimum of 6,000 calories. And some of that could be taken in at the Hodori salad bar. Hodori makes your salad. Oh, please tell me there was somebody dressed up as Hodori making your salad. I don't know. <laughs> but it was funny to see, like, they had all the menus listed out and it would be like Hodori salad bar. I'm like, really? <laughs> they named it after Hodori? Okay. He likes his salads. A point of pride for the organizers, Seoul served 266 different kinds of food, 39 more than LA 84. So there's a lot of typical services in the village. You had your bank, your post office, your beauty salon, the medical center had Western medical services, Korean herbal medicine, and for the first time in Olympic history, acupuncture. Nice. Not so popular was the ham radio office which was used to transmit Olympic news. And the, it, can you imagine, that was the thing that jumped out at me. Like, ham radio office. Who would use that? That would be 100 people, which I believe was 97 more than went to the Esperanto lecture at Montreal 1976. Do you realize that probably we have three listeners who even know what a ham radio is? Because that's so antiquated now because of the internet. I know, but it still exists, So I know. I mean, there are still ham radio operators, but yeah, that was a fun little thing that they had there. I, don't, I mean, and obviously not many people knew how to use it back then either. They were too busy going to the 100 store shopping mall, the discotheque, your ever popular discotheque. You got to have a discotheque. Right. They had a music and tea room where you could play chess and Japanese go. They had a video game room, a billiards room, table tennis room, movie room, Korea exhibition room, and an atelier where artists would draw your portrait. Fancy. The religious center served six religions. They covered Protestant, Catholic, Buddhist, Greek Orthodox, Islam, and Judaism. And then the gym, also a very, very popular place. They had weights, of course. They also had a swimming pool and a sauna in case you needed to drop your weight for your weight class events. Yeah. Because you spent too much time in the dining hall with the 266 dishes. <laughs> Athletes could go on outings. They had lots of factory tours. They had a folk village tour. The organizers did try a home visit program where you could go in and stay with the regular citizens as a way to promote friendship that bombed on both sides of the equation because there weren't enough volunteer families and only 45 participants from the athlete side. But I think one of the big things here was meal prep. And when you're an athlete, you got to be really consistent with your food right up until your event. So that was just the stuff to do. Village Mayor Kim yong shik and the organizers also planned tons of events. There was a flag raising ceremony for every NOC, not necessarily the day they arrived, but they had one. So they hoisted the flag, they had the anthem, there were lots of greetings, a little presentation of gifts. If you were one of the 21 countries that had a national holiday for your country, while the games were happening, your delegation got a congratulatory garland. And then they did this also for China's National Foundation Day. If your birthday fell during the Olympics, and we saw this in Beijing, you got a party at the discotheque with cake and some small souvenir gifts. They had 756 birthday parties. That's a lot of trips to the sauna to burn off the cake. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had a traditional wedding ceremony to show what that was like in Korea. They also had a village arts festival with a whole bunch of performances, including programs pertinent to each continent. This is where it gets good. For example, African Night included a laser beam display and Senegalese folk dancing. On European Night, athletes from Europe sang a song called Bonus, Bonus, Bonus. Was that the winner of the Eurovision contest that year? You know, I don't know, but it would be a bonus if any listeners knew what that song was. <laughs> could tell us. And then on American Night, 14 California models staged a show called With California. And then, of course, there was a big Korean night to celebrate Chuseok, which is an autumn harvest festival. And that celebration, of course, included some K-pop. The group Love Machine performed. Did they perform bonus, bonus, bonus? I wish. There was also a swinging contest. Okay, that sounds 
Get your mind out of the gutter, Allison. Okay. This is like playground swings. Oh, thank goodness. And this is apparently a traditional Korean game where you get these swings that are on really, I guess they're really tall. And you stand up on the board and you see how high you can go. So they had singles and then they had mixed doubles where you put two people on the swing. We are entering that contest <laughs> and we are winning. <laughs> Canada won singles, Turkey won mixed doubles, and Kodak donated the prizes. But maybe the most unusual event at the Olympic Village took place on the night before the closing ceremony where, you know, athletes from all over the world had gotten the chance to interact with each other and make new friends. So what better way to close out the games than with the Miss Olympic Village pageant? Ah, the sexism of the 80s. <laughs> the village mayor and 300 other athletes and officials enjoyed the three-part program where contestants were judged on jogging suit, uniform, and native costume. Who won? <laughs> Please tell me who won. The grand prize winner was Teresa Folga, a rhythmic gymnast from Poland. The gold prize went to Chen Yian, who is a Taekwondo competitor from Chinese Taipei. Silver went to fencer Sylvia Koswandi from Indonesia. Bronze went to Park Siyun of Korea. Artistic gymnast Revital Sharon won the popularity prize. And the Good Health Prize went to Juliana Yendork, a long jumper from Ghana. So the whirlwind of fun had to end at some point. The village closed four, on October 6, four days after the closing ceremonies. And somewhere out there, there is a documentary because the official report said crews made films and videos about daily life in the, in the village. So somewhere we could see all of this happening. And hopefully one day we will. Welcome to Shukflistan. That sound means it is time to check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests of the show who make up our citizenship of our very own country, Shukflistan. First up, we have some results. Yeah, so Kim Rohde won gold in women's skeet at the first ISSF World Cup competition of the season in Morocco. Kim was also elected as one of four vice presidents to the ISSF Executive Committee. And former sled hockey player Taylor Lipset will be doing color commentary for the Hangar Live Sled Hockey Classic, which will feature an ex exhibition of Team USA versus Team USA. And those teams will include members of the U.S. men's and women's development teams. So we get to see some ladies doing some sled hockey, which will be exciting. This will take place on Monday, January 23rd at 6.45 p.m. Central Time on uh, Hangar News' YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Hangar News. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> Oh, we have a little bit of a technical update to the Camilla Valieva situation from Beijing 2022. Shocking update. The Russian anti-doping agency, Rusada, finds Camilla Valieva had no fault or negligence in her doping situation. She will not be penalized. Not basically, a surprise. <laughs> basically, this is just kicking the can to WADA. Because we knew Rusada was going to be. Camilla did nothing wrong. She's queen. Wada is concerned about that. They, they are not happy with the results of this finding, and they're going to appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Meanwhile, we are close to the one-year anniversary of the situation, and we've got three teams with no medals. Hospitality packages are now available for sale for Paris 2024. This is not... I, I think we can find more ways to become more confusing about what's going on with the ticket sales. And congratulations, Paris 2024. You're doing it right if you want to do that. So w tickets are not on sale. There's still the ticket lottery. That's for individual tickets, which I I uh, I've did my application last night. Oh, how'd it go? Yeah. It was simple. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, except for they ask you what your favorite sports are, and you can only choose so many. It was that was the hardest part was choosing my favorite sports. What are your f favorite sports at the Olympics? Yes. <laughs> 
So, but they have hospitality packages, which include tickets to events. They can include um, fun activities. They can include hotel and flights. They can kind of include what you want them to include for a price, of course. So uh, Paris 2024 has partnered with On Location for the packages. You get the guaranteed tickets to sports sessions. Uh, right now, these are only for events in Paris, so they don't have sailing, shooting, or surfing as an option. They also don't have opening and closing ceremonies yet. So <clears throat> whole process, I, I kind of dug into this process today, and it seems complicated to figure out what's included. The the IOC was touting that there are packages that packages that start below a hundred euros, but of course it's hard to figure out what it is because you really have to go in through what sport do I want to see, and then you find out what's available and for what price it is. So I clicked on three x three basketball, and they had four pool pack four pool games for $295 and that includes access to a hospitality suite and a gift. So that's the kind of thing you're looking at. There's um there are cheaper ones, there are obviously way more expensive ones, and there are different levels of hospitality packages you could get along with your tickets. So we'll have a link to all of those uh where you go in the show notes. It's olympics.onlocationexp dot com slash Paris twenty twenty four. And don't be shocked when you see some of these costs because someone had posted the cost for the team gymna women's gymnastics final in these hospitality packages. I believe the nosebleed seats were starting at fifteen hundred euros. Wow. So these packages are no joke in terms of cost, but you're guaranteed the ticket. And that's part of what you're paying for. You're not going through the lottery and just taking a chance. Right. And and I've seen on the Paris 2024 planning group that some people have taken that option because they do want the guaranteed ticket. So, uh, you know, check it out if you want to make sure you get what you want to go to. Um, and it, it's the you, you weigh the cost benefit analysis your, yourself. Also, a little update from the Japan Times, they have reported that there's concern over the fact that the Athletes Village, speaking of Athletes Villages today, uh, the Athletes Village is not going to have air conditioning because Paris 2024 wants to be carbon neutral and air conditioning is not very carbon neutral. Uh, the uh, Soledio, which is the construction company involved here, say, says they're building rooms that will be six degrees cooler than the outside temperature. Unfortunately, last summer they had a big heat wave and temperatures got up to like 40 degrees Celsius, which is 104 Fahrenheit or so. And so if you think about rooms that are six degrees cooler than that, they're still really, really hot. <laughs> so uh, Soledio says they could add air condition in if it <clears throat> they can they can add or Saladio says they can add in air conditioning air conditioning in if it's wanted but that will obviously affect the carbon footprint of the games so Paris 2024 is looking into the option including using floor fans to help okay have you ever lived in an apartment without air conditioning you oh yeah have. yes yeah, yeah. in a dorm yeah yeah in a dorm yeah <sighs> You can't sleep mm -mm. when it's 90 degrees. And that's fine if all you have to do is go to your air-conditioned office the next day and you're a little tired. But if you're competing in the most important day of your life, come on. Right. So uh, right now, we don't really know what's going on, but apparently – the Japan Times reported that some sports federations are looking into other accommodations so that their athletes can have air conditioning and be at a reasonable temperature overnight. I think it's really funny that this is being reported by the Japan Times, given how much before COVID, <laughs> all the talk in Tokyo was about what temperature it's going to be. I feel like Tokyo is saying, see, it's not us. It's you people.
So we've got a little bit of IOC news, and that's f- aimed for our listeners here in Europe. We've got a new broadcast deal for four games from 2026 through 2032. IOC has signed rights with the European Broadcast Union and Warner Brothers Discovery. It sounds like it's going to be what you've had before, where your public service broadcasters will get 200 or so hours of free-to-air coverage for the summer games and at least 100 hours for winter games coverage. And that will be on stations like the BBC and your country's public service channels. That will also include TV, radio, live streams, and digital reporting that covers the 49 countries who are part of the EBU. Discovery will provide the rest of the coverage, which is the bulk of the coverage, and I I believe that's pay access for that. This does not include Russia and Belarus because those countries have been suspended from the EBU. So Russian broadcaster Match TV is now trying to negotiate its own rights for 2026 and 2028, according to Inside the Games. We have some good news for listeners who are in Southeast Asia. If you get Redentes Sport, they now have the broadcast rights for the Paris 2024 Paralympics, and it will bring them to 13 countries. That's twice as many countries as got the Paralympics in Tokyo. So that's exciting. We want more Paralympic coverage. That's right. And the Paralympics is thrilled about that. And that is also news from Inside the Games. We would like to give a special shout out to our patrons. We have posted a debrief of our interview with Michael Payne. We'll have some Dick Pound content, of course. And we're working on our February show with rule changes that will impact Paris 2024. Find out how to support the show and get access to these extras at flamealivepod.com slash support. That will do it for for this week. Let us know your favorite Dick Pound moments from his time with the IOC. I would love to hear what you guys have to, what your thoughts on Dick Pound are. And you can email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Our social handle is at flamealivepod. And be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. And don't forget to get our weekly newsletter filled with other fun stories about this week's podcast. You can sign up at flamealivepod.com. Next week, part two, Dick Pound going rogue on doping. Be there. (laughs) You will not want to miss it. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.